This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti Federalist Papers. Anti Federalist No. 8. Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican, No. 6. December 25, 1787. Dear Sir, my former letters to you respecting the Constitution proposed were calculated merely to lead to a fuller investigation of the subject. Having more extensively considered it, and the opinions of others relative to it, I shall, in a few letters, more particularly endeavor to point out the defects and propose amendments. I shall in this make only a few general and introductory observations, which, in the present state of the momentous question, may not be improper and I leave you in all cases to decide by a careful examination of my works, upon the weight of my arguments, the propriety of my remarks, the uprightness of my intentions, and the extent of my candor, I presume I am writing to a man of candor and reflection, and not to an ardent, peevish, or impatient man. When the Constitution was first published, there appeared to prevail a misguided zeal to prevent a fair, unbiased examination of a subject of infinite importance to this people and their posterity, to the cause of liberty and the rights of mankind, and it was the duty of those who saw a restless ardor or design attempting to mislead the people by a parade of names and by a parade of names and misrepresentations to endeavor to prevent their having their intended effects. The only way to stop the passions of men in their career is coolly to state facts and deliberately to avow the truth, and to do this we are frequently forced into a painful view of men and measures. Since I wrote to you in October, I have heard much said, and seen many pieces written, upon the subject in question, and on carefully examining them on both sides, I find much less reason for changing my sentiments respecting the good and defective parts of the system proposed than I expected. The opposers, as well as the advocates of it, confirm me in my opinion, that this system affords, all circumstances considered, a better basis to build upon than the Confederation. And as to the principal defects, as the smallness of the representation, the insecurity of elections, the undue mixture of powers in the Senate, the insecurity of some essential rights, etc., the opposition appears generally to agree respecting them, and many of the ablest advocates virtually admit to them. Clear it is, the latter do not attempt manfully to defend these defective parts, but to cover them with a mysterious veil. They concede, they retract, they say we could do no better, and some of them, when a little out of temper and hard pushed, used arguments that do more honor to their ingenuity than to their candor and firmness. Three states have now adopted the Constitution without amendments. These and other circumstances ought to have their weight in deciding the question whether we will put the system into operation, adopt it, enumerate and recommend the necessary amendments, which afterwards, by three-fourths of the states, may be engrafted into the system, or whether we will make the amendments prior to the adoption. I only undertake to show amendments are essential and necessary, how far it is practicable to engraft them into the plan prior to the adoption the state conventions must determine. Our situation is critical, and we have but our choice of evils. We may hazard much by adopting the Constitution in its present form. We may hazard more by rejecting it wholly. We may hazard much by long contending about amendments prior to adoption. The greatest political evils that can befall us are discords and civil wars. The greatest blessings we can wish for are peace, union, and industry under a mild, free, and steady government. Amendments recommended will tend to guard and direct the administration, but there will be danger that the people, after the system shall be adopted, will become inattentive to amendments. Their attention is now awake. The discussion of the subject, which has already taken place, has had a happy effect. It has called forth the able advocates of liberty, and tends to renew, in the minds of the people, their true republican jealousy and vigilance, the strongest guard against the abuses of power. But the vigilance of the people is not sufficiently constant to be depended upon. Fortunate it is for the body of a people if they can continue attentive to their liberties, 
long enough to erect for them a temple and constitutional barriers for their permanent security when they are well fixed between the powers of the rulers and the rights of the people they become visible boundaries constantly seen by all and any transgression of them is immediately discovered they serve as sentinels for the people at all times and especially in those unavoidable intervals of inattention some of the advocates i believe will agree to recommend good amendments but some of them will only consent to recommend indefinite specious but unimportant ones and this only with a view to keep the door open for obtaining in some favorable moment their main object a complete consolidation of the states and a government much higher toned less republican and free than the one proposed if necessity therefore should ever oblige us to adopt the system and recommend amendments the true friends of a federal republic must see they are well defined and well calculated not only to prevent our system of government moving further from republican principles and equality but to bring it back nearer to them they must be constantly on their guard against the address flattery and manoeuvres of their adversaries the gentlemen who oppose the constitution or contend for amendments in it are frequently and with much bitterness charged with wantonly attacking the men who framed it the unjustness of this charge leads me to make one observation upon the conduct of parties etc some of the advocates are only pretended federalists in fact they wish for an abolition of the state governments some of them i believe to be honest federalists who wish to preserve substantially the state governments united under an efficient federal head and many of them are blind tools without any object some of the opposers also are only pretended federalists who want no federal government or one merely advisory some of them are the true federalists their object perhaps more clearly seen is the same with that of the honest federalists and some of them probably have no distinct object we might as well call the advocates and opposers tories and whigs or anything else as federalists and anti-federalists to be for or against the constitution as it stands is not much evidence of a federal disposition if any names are applicable to the parties on account of their general politics they are those of republicans and anti-republicans the opposers are generally men who support the rights of the body of the people and are properly republicans the advocates are generally men not very friendly to these rights and properly anti-republicans had the advocates left the constitution as they ought to have done to be adopted or rejected on account of its own merits or imperfections i do not believe the gentlemen who framed it would have ever been alluded to in the contest by the opposers instead of this the ardent advocates begun by quoting names as incontestable authorities for the implicit adoption of the system without any examination treated all who opposed it as friends of anarchy and with an indecent virulence addressed m n g y l e and almost to every man of weight they could find in the opposition by name if they had been candid men they would have applauded the moderation of the opposers for not retaliating in this pointed manner when so fair an opportunity was given them but the opposers generally saw that it was no time to heat the passions but at the same time they saw there was something more than mere zeal in many of their adversaries they saw them attempting to mislead the people and to precipitate their divisions by the sound of names and forced to do it the opposers in general terms alleged those names were not of sufficient authority to justify the hasty adoption of the system contended for the convention as a whole was undoubtedly respectable it was generally composed of members of the then and preceding congresses as a body of respectable men we ought to view it to select individual names is an invitation to personal attacks and the advocates for their own sake ought to have known the abilities politics and situation of some of their favorite characters better before they held them up to view in the manner they did as men entitled to our implicit political belief they ought to have known whether all the men they so held up to view could for their past conduct in public offices be approved or not by the public records and the honest part of the community these ardent advocates seem now to be peevish and angry because by their own folly they have led to an investigation of facts and political characters unfavorable to them which they had not the discernment to foresee 
they may well apprehend they have opened a door to some junius, or to some man, after his manner, with his polite addresses to men by name, to state serious facts and unfold the truth. But these advocates may rest assured that cool men in the opposition, best acquainted with the affairs of the country, will not, in the critical passage of a people from one constitution to another, pursue inquiries which in other circumstances will be deserving of the highest praise. I will say nothing further about political characters, but examine the Constitution, and as a necessary and previous measure to a particular examination, I shall state a few general positions and principles, which receive a general assent, and briefly notice the leading features of the Confederation, and several state conventions, i.e., constitutions, to which through the whole investigation we must frequently have recourse to aid the mind in its determinations. We can put but little dependence on the partial and vague information transmitted to us respecting ancient governments. Our situation as a people is peculiar. Our people in general have a high sense of freedom. They are high-spirited, though capable of deliberate measures. They are intelligent, discerning, and well-informed, and it is to their condition we must mould the constitution and laws. We have no royal or noble families, and all things concur in favour of a government, entirely elective. We have tried our abilities as freemen in a most arduous contest, and have succeeded, but we now find the mainspring of our movements were the love of liberty, and a temporary ardour, and not any energetic principle in the federal system. Our territories are far too extensive for a limited monarchy, in which the representatives must frequently assemble, and the laws operate mildly and systematically. The most eligible system is a federal republic, that is, a system in which national concerns may be transacted in the center, and local affairs in state or district governments. The powers of the Union ought to be extended to commerce, the coin, and national objects, and a division of powers, and a deposit of them in different hands, is safest. Good government is generally the result of experience and gradual improvements, and a punctual execution of the laws is essential to the preservation of life, liberty, and property. Taxes are always necessary, and the power to raise them can never be safely lodged without checks and limitation. But in a full and substantial representation of the body of the people, the quantity of power delegated ought to be compensated by the brevity of the time holding it, in order to prevent the possessors increasing it. The supreme power is in the people, and rulers possess only that portion which is expressly given them, yet the wisest people have often declared this is the case on proper occasions, and have carefully formed stipulations to fix the extent and limit the exercise of the power given. The people, by Magna Carta, etc., did not acquire powers or receive privileges from the king. They only ascertained and fixed those they were entitled to as Englishmen. The title used by the king, we grant, was mere form. Representation and the jury trial are the best features of a free government as ever yet discovered, and the only means by which the body of the people can have their proper influence in the affairs of government. In a federal system we must not only balance the parts of the same government as those of the state or that of the union, but we must find a balancing influence between the general and local governments. The latter is what men or writers have but very little or imperfectly considered. A free and mild government is that in which no laws can be made without the formal and free consent of the people, or of their constitutional representatives, that is, of a substantial representative branch. Liberty, in its genuine sense, is security to enjoy the effects of our honest industry and labors, in a free government, and personal security from all illegal restraints. Of rights, some are natural and unalienable, of which even the people cannot deprive individuals. Some are constitutional or fundamental. These cannot be altered or abolished by the ordinary laws, but the people, by express acts, may alter or abolish them. These, such as the trial by jury, the benefits of the writ of habeas corpus, etc., individuals claim under the solemn compacts of the people as constitutions, or at least under laws so strengthened by long usage as not to be repealable by the ordinary legislature, 
and some are common or mere legal rights, that is, such as individuals claim under laws which the ordinary legislature may alter or abolish at pleasure. The Confederation is a league of friendship among the states or sovereignties for the common defense and mutual welfare. Each state expressly retains its sovereignty and all powers not expressly given to Congress. All federal powers are lodged in a Congress of delegates annually elected by the state legislatures, except in Connecticut and Rhode Island, where they are chosen by the people. Each state has a vote in Congress, pays its delegates, and may instruct or recall them. No delegate can hold any office of profit or serve more than three years in any six. Each state may be represented by not less than two or more than seven delegates. Congress, nine states agreeing, may make peace and war, treaties and alliances, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, regulate the alloy and value of coin, regulate men and monies of the states by fixed proportions, and appropriate monies, form armies and navies, emit bills of credit, and borrow monies. Congress, seven states agreeing, may send and receive ambassadors, regulate captures, make rules for governing the army and navy, institute courts for the trial of piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and for settling territorial disputes between the individual states, regulate weights and measures, post offices, and Indian affairs. No state without the consent of Congress can send or receive embassies, make any agreement with any other state or a foreign state, keep up any vessels of war or bodies of forces in time of peace, engage in war, or lay any duties which may interfere with the treaties of Congress. Each state must appoint regimental officers and keep up a well-regulated militia. Each state may prohibit the importation or exportation of any species of goods. The free inhabitants of one state are entitled to the privileges and immunities of the free citizens of the other states. Credit in each state shall be given to the records and judicial proceedings in the others. Canada, a seating, may be admitted, and any other colony may be admitted by the consent of nine states. Alterations may be made by the agreement of Congress and confirmation of all the state legislatures. The following, I think, will be allowed to be unalienable or fundamental rights in the United States. No man, demeaning himself peaceably, shall be molested on account of his religion or mode of worship. The people have a right to hold and enjoy their property according to known standing laws, and which cannot be taken from them without their consent, or the consent of their representatives. And whenever taken in the pressing urgencies of government, they are to receive a reasonable compensation for it. Individual security consists in having free recourse to the laws. The people are subject to no laws or taxes not assented to by their representatives constitutionally assembled. They are at all times entitled to the benefits of the writ of habeas corpus, the trial by jury in criminal and civil cases. They have a right, when charged, to a speedy trial in the vicinage, to be heard by themselves or counsel, not to be compelled to furnish evidence against themselves, to have witnesses face to face, and to confront their adversaries before the judge. No man is held to answer a crime charged upon him till it be substantially described to him, and he is subject to no unreasonable searches or seizures of his person, papers, or effects. The people have a right to assemble in an orderly manner and petition the government for a redress of wrongs. The freedom of the press ought not to be restrained. No emoluments except for actual service, no hereditary honors or orders of nobility ought to be allowed. The military ought to be subordinate to the civil authority, and no soldier be quartered on the citizens without their consent. The militia ought always to be armed and disciplined, and the usual defense of the country. The supreme power is in the people, and power delegated ought to return to them at stated periods, and frequently. The legislative, executive, and judicial powers ought always to be kept distinct. Others, perhaps, might be added. The organization of the state governments. Each state has a legislature, an executive, and a judicial branch. In general, legislators are excluded from the important executive and judicial offices. Except in the Carolinas, there is no constitutional distinction among Christian sects. The constitutions of New York, Delaware, and Virginia exclude the clergy from offices civil and military. The other states do nearly the same in practice. 
Each state has a Democratic branch elected twice a year, in Rhode Island and Connecticut, biennially in South Carolina, and annually in the other states. There are about 1,500 representatives in all the states, or one to each 1,700 inhabitants, reckoning five blacks for three whites. The states do not differ as to the age or moral characters of the electors or elected, nor materially as to their property. Pennsylvania has lodged all her legislative powers in a single branch, and Georgia has done the same. The other eleven states have each in their legislatures a second or senatorial branch. In forming this they have combined various principles and aimed at several checks and balances. It is amazing to see how ingenuity has worked in the several states to fix a barrier against popular instability. In Massachusetts, the senators are apportioned on districts according to the taxes they pay, nearly according to property. In Connecticut, the free men in September vote for twenty councillors and return the names of those voted for in the several towns. The legislature takes the twenty who have the most votes and gives them to the people, who in April choose twelve of them, who, with the governor and deputy governor, form the senatorial branch. In Maryland, the senators are chosen by two electors from each county. These electors are chosen by the freemen, and qualified as the members of the Democratic branch are. In these two cases, checks are aimed at in the mode of election. Several states have taken into view the periods of service, age, and property, and etc. In South Carolina, a senator is elected for two years, in Delaware three, and in New York and Virginia four in Maryland five, and in the other states for one. In New York and Virginia, one-fourth part go out yearly. In Virginia, a senator must be twenty-five years old, in South Carolina, thirty. In New York, the electors must each have a freehold worth two hundred and fifty dollars. In North Carolina, a freehold of fifty acres of land. In the other states, the electors of senators are qualified as electors of representatives are. In Massachusetts, a senator must have a freehold in his own right worth $1,000, or any estate worth 2000 In New Jersey, any estate worth 2666 In South Carolina, worth $1,300. In North Carolina, 300 acres of land in fee, etc. The numbers of senators in each state are from 10 to 31, about 160 in the 11 states, about 1 to 14,000 inhabitants. Two states, Massachusetts and New York, have each introduced into their legislatures a third but incomplete branch. In the former, the governor may negative any law not supported by two-thirds of the senators and two-thirds of the representatives. In the latter, the governor, chancellor, and judges of the Supreme Court may do the same. Each state has a single executive branch. In the five eastern states, the people at large elect their governors. In the other states, the legislatures elect them. In South Carolina, the governor is elected once in two years, in New York and Delaware once in three, and in the other states annually. The governor of New York has no executive council. The other governors have. In several states, the governor has a vote in the senatorial branch. The governors have, sim the governors have similar powers in some instances, and quite dissimilar ones in others. The number of executive councilors in the states are from five to twelve. In the four eastern states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, they are of the men returned legislators by the people. In Pennsylvania, the councillors are chosen triennially, in Delaware every fourth year, in Virginia every three years, in South Carolina biennially, and in the other states yearly. Each state has a judicial branch, each common law courts, superior and inferior, some chancery and admiralty courts. The courts in general sit in different places in order to accommodate the citizens. The trial by jury is had in all the common law courts and in some of the admiralty courts. The democratic freemen principally form the juries. Men destitute of property, of character, or under age are excluded as in elections. Some of the judges are during good behavior, and some appointed for a year, and some for years, and all are dependent on the legislatures for their salaries. Particulars respecting this department are too many to be noticed here. Yours and etc. The Federal Farmer. End of Anti-Federalist, Section Number Eight.